So hi, everybody. Great to see you all here. We're engaged in this class called um, Four Opponents uh, for Daily Life. And we'll talk about that very shortly. Um, in the meantime, let's take refuge together and generate the mind of enlightenment. And to do that, we need to be sort of relaxed and present. So please uh, make yourselves comfortable in your seat. So have your back nice and straight, your shoulders relaxed. And place your hands wherever you like. And while you continue to breathe normally and naturally, allow yourself to feel the movements of the body as you inhale and exhale. So along with the movements, you might also be able to um, feel uh, other things. So we just want to be present with the breath. <coughs> We're slowing down. We're allowing the mind and the body to relax and the mind to be focused. So now imagine that the Buddha and his spiritual entourage of the Bodhisattvas, um, the Arahats, and the protectors and so forth appear in the space um, in front of you and slightly above your eye line. So you're sort of looking up at them. Each of these beings has a body of light. And this light is representing uh, all of their good qualities. Then Imagine that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. So you have the enlightened beings above you and the ordinary beings uh, surrounding you. So now I'll take a few moments to think about um, why you are engaging in this teaching which uses the four opponent powers in daily life. What's the purpose for listening to this teaching? And see if you can um, include within your purpose, all the beings, the sentient beings uh, surrounding you. Okay, now to accomplish this purpose, decide to rely upon the Buddha and the spiritual entourage, uh, the teachings they've taught, and them as a spiritual community to, to help you accomplish that purpose. So, which means we're going to take uh, refuge in them, we're going to depend upon them to help us accomplish our purpose, which will benefit others. So let's uh, recite this verse together, uh, three times together in English. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Supreme Assembly. 
By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And then to strengthen this aspiration and to put a really great foundation beneath it, recollect the four immeasurable thoughts. And wish that all beings um, have a measurable equanimity, a measurable compassion, um, a measurable love, and a measurable joy. I decide to develop these four immeasurables yourself and be willing to share the, your knowledge of how you did that with others. And while you're in front of this great um, field for creating merit, we can recite the seven limb prayer together. So reverently, I prostrate with my body, speech and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the meritable, holy and ordinary beings. Please remain until the end of cyclic existence and turn the wheel of Dharma for living beings. I dedicate my own and others' merits to the great enlightenment. Then to rid ourselves of any clinging that we might have to uh, the merit, and uh, to ourselves and our goal, we can offer a mandala. So thinking that this ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Mary, four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guratna Mandala Kam Meriatayami. We release the offering and it's accepted by the Buddha and he smiles at us with delight and we look up into his face and in particular at his eyes. And we acknowledge the smile and we feel accepted and at ease. And now an emanation of the Buddha uh, leaves his own heart and moves through space and comes to abide above the crown of your head, facing in the same direction you are. The emanation uh, descends, entering the crown of your head coming down through your body and stops at the level of your heart, whereby its radiance begins to increase, filling your body and mind with light. And the light goes out through the pores of your skin and spreads out into the 10 directions of space, filling space completely. And wherever there are beings who exist within space, Think that they are touched by this light and transformed into the fully awakened state. And they are no different than you. And then the light begins to withdraw and it re enters your heart. You find yourself breathing normally and naturally. You know you are embodied. 
and you realize this meditation is just on the level of imagination. And it's left an imprint upon your mind uh, to become awakened and be able to benefit others effortlessly and spontaneously. Uh, so with a sense of accomplishment and joy, breathe in through your nostrils. And then exhale through your mouth. And in your own time, allow your eyes to flutter open and find yourself present in front of your screen. So let's have a look, first of all, at what we have studied. So we began by looking at karma, which is just another word for, for actions. And these actions are the actions of intention. So these actions are carried out by a person who possesses a consciousness. And this person is capable of having a sentient experience. And these actions uh, have, um, are made up of uh, stages, and they're also carried out by the body, the speech, and mind itself. These actions bring about different types of effect. And we looked at um, four types of karmic effect. Yeah. So we had the uh, fruitional effect and the environmental effect. And then we had effects of behavior and experience. Then we looked at what we could do about um, altering these um, effects when they were of a destructive nature. So we wanna, if we look, look at a, uh, something we might have done, which was uh, destructive, we could see this, this action will produce some sort of effect and that will be of a similar type of nature. And we don't want to experience that. So we need to do something about it and we can use the four opponents uh, powers to do that. And these four opponent powers, each of them of course affects one part of the action itself. Now, um, I'll just, one, just say a few other words. So I found this on the Alexander Berzin site and I, I really liked it. So I just want to share it, share it with you. So he says, um, when we understand karma to mean the compulsiveness, it's a compulsion, it's, a, it's an intention that has some power, right? to mean the compulsiveness that drives us to act, speak, and think in uncontrollable ways, we realize its role as a true source of our sufferings and problems. Acting compulsively, causes us unhappiness, brings recurring difficulties in life, and prevents us from being of best help to others. So here, remember, we're just talking about the destructive karmas, destructive actions. To rid ourselves of the compulsiveness of karma and the problems it engenders, we need uh, ethical self-discipline to refrain from destructive behavior, from grasping at the fantasies that we have about ourselves and our world, and from this self-centered concern. So I wanted to um, read that to you, because we've just finished the course here with Venerable Rabina, and it became very obvious there when we talked about karma, how this is, it's just we're out of control, and we make mistakes about what's actually causing us the suffering. And then we compulsively act on this mistaken apprehension. And of course, when we do that, then effects follow and they're of a destructive nature too, a painful nature. So what we're gonna look at today, of course, is um, what we can do about that, like, sort of like on the run. Right? So we might be out and about somewhere and something happens and we immediately get angry. So you'll know that when we immediately get angry, something's gonna cause that to take place, doesn't it? There's an object. The mind engages with some object and in response to that object, we're getting something we, we don't like, 
something that seems painful to us. Now, this object can be external to us or it can be um, inner. And really, we act, we're going to act with our body, our speech, or our mind. So, when we, um, so when we use the, the, the opponent powers, there's basically three places you can use them. You can use them um, before you get angry, which is what we should do. So we sort of get used to the technique, right? used to the what they call training, the process. Yeah? So we do that. And we go, okay, these are the four opponents, and this is this is the process of purification. This is what I do. Yeah? So that's great. Now we go out into the world, and then. Our senses light a light on an object, probably a person, or maybe it's something else other than a person, because we get angry at the weather or cars, we're angry at anything basically. Right? So our senses are gonna light on that object, and so it's something unlikable about it, something we find disagreeable, something that's a little painful to us. And our response is this what we call anger. So first it's, it's gonna be mental. Yeah? And then it's like going to come out for our speech, most likely, and sometimes even follows we, we do something with our body. So that's before, and then we, we're in it. And often when, you, when we are angry, it takes quite a bit of time to sort of um, calm down and then to do something. So, so if you do remember how long it was when, um, when Corey was telling us how long of anger affects you, yeah, it's it's quite a few seconds. It's not it's not a quick thing. No, no so it's even not a the, quick thing because it's to do also with um, you know, you have a you have adrenaline when you have anger, and so that has to go through your system and wear out. You can't kind of put it back in again. <laughs> oh, so and, and and until that happens, until you get that sort of quiet space, uh, you can't reason. Uh, and and anybody who tries to help you you're going to see them as being part of the problem too. Right? You're going to, it's going to appear to you that these people are contributing to your anger. So this uh, is the, the sort of the chemical stuff that's going on inside here. This is just how it works. Um, but it's also helpful if you try and help somebody who's angry. You, you, you know, you should know, okay, if I can't, it's not going to work straight away. In fact, I should probably count to more than 10 and then go say something, you know. <laughs> yeah. So let's, okay, let's have a look now. We'll, um, we'll actually have a look at some of these slides and um, continue. So, um, so of course, I've relied on... Um, teachings, especially Rabina's was wonderful over the weekend, but also from previous teachers, and also on these particular books. Now, I'll put, you know, the heading is great books on using the four opponent powers. Well, what these books are really great at is finding the, the opponents to anger. Because, you know, when we, as you know, you'll see shortly again, um, when we have to use the four opponent powers, you know, we've, we've got to, it's called the power of recompense, isn't it? You now we have to do something to work against the anger. And these books are fantastic for showing you what some of those things are. So you'll see most, a lot of them here are all based on, they're all um, mind training texts. So some of them are about specific mind trainings, and some of them you can sort of look at using the um, what they call the uh, graded stages of the path to enlightenment, the Lamb Rim. Um, so the, why I've pulled all these books up is to sort of um, share what I know with you, of course. And, and the way I want to do that is not make the assumption on my part that everybody here knows how to use thought thought transformation techniques. Everyone here knows how to do giving and taking, for instance, and are quite proficient with it. This might not be the case. Right? So I thought what I could do is um, introduce you to some of, the, some of the opponents, some of the ways of thinking from the, um, 
lower stages of the path, then the middle stages, and then the great stages. So you can go whatever part, part of the path you're familiar with, you have something you can call upon to use. couple of slides you would be a little familiar with because they've put them up before. But here the Buddha is saying, look, Maitreya, but a Bodhisattva, a great being, possesses these four teachings. Non-virtuous actions that are performed and accumulated will be overcome. And what are these four? They are the power of remorse, the power of the antidote, the power of turning away from faults, and the power of the basis. So all those other books before, they're all about the power of the antidote. What we can do, whether we're, whether we're going to take something from the lower stages of the path, the middle or the great. So today's outcomes, we're going to use these four opponent powers against anger. But just anger today. So before I remember, I, I asked some of you who are participating in this to uh, write in and tell me some of the problems that you might have faced. So basically, you can look at all the problems and just put them into desirous attachment rooted problems or anger rooted problems. And we know that beneath them is this ignorance, is misapprehending things. So today I want to look at how we can work against anger, and next week I'll use it up again to show the same four opponents against with this greed, desirous attachment. And we're going to do it through using, like I said, practices that we can find from the small scope to middling scope and the great paths of practice. Now, when we begin, when we have, when we engage in any type of action, like this is an action here, we're actually going to produce anger in the mind, and then we might do something with our speech or with the body. When we've finished the action, you know, there's a culmination, right? We, we've We've exhibited our anger. We've done it to somebody, or that's the basis. And we've, we've, we've either performed it just mentally, so it's just afflictive here, or it's come out through our body and speech, so we've performed it in some way. And there's an attitude driving that. And these are the things that we can use to oppose, like, for instance, the culmination, that's remorse. So, like, if we're angry and we're glad, you know, like we, we got rid of our hindrance. The way to go against that is to have actually for remorse. And this purifies experiences similar to the cause. The basis of the person or some other object that we hurt, we need to rely upon some, something else. In this case, as you know, it's usually the three jewels of refuge and the mind of enlightenment. It stops the fruition environmental uh, result. Here's, like I said, this is the thing we're really going to be talking about today, these different remedies we can use, purifying the throwing karma. And in terms of the attitude, we, make, we decide to not behave like that for a period of time. So again, this is material we introduced last week. And as we go through uh, the presentation today, we'll, I'll show you these will come up again and again. So that you actually know what you're doing when you do it. What's the outcome of my um, remorse? What's the outcome of my reliance? What am I actually stopping here? So let's begin by looking at this first one here, the power of remorse. So here we've got to imagine we've already gotten angry. And we know that, oh my gosh, like we, we don't like the outcomes. So this remorse is the opposing experiences um, similar to the cause. This is what remorse does. But to, to have an authentic remorse, and to, to be strong, you actually have to know what the consequences of, the, of your behavior, what they will be on you, how they're going to affect you. So does anybody have any ideas 
or recollect from previous teachings and so forth, what some of these experiences which are similar to the cause. So we're going to anger the cause, and then we're going to have some sort of experience that might be similar, similar to that, which we, 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 we want to avoid that, right? It's going to be very unpleasant to have an experience similar to the cause. Um, I've, I've got one of just, uh, well, if it's to do with anger, of just every little thing makes you cross. Yeah, Is that? Cross. Yeah, you could, that would, um, that would fit in. Because you're talking so you're about often, ex- um, So what's, why are you cross though? Well, um, it's like just a general being cross in your mind and you don't know until something happens and you get cross at it, then another thing happens and you get cross at it. Um, yeah, you could, you could put that in there. So does anybody else have any ideas? So let me tell you this. Okay, this is how I might help you work, work this out. I've sort of been thinking, you know, so a lot of with Dharma teachings, we have somebody like myself, so I'm import, um, imparting the information to you, and and you hear it, and you've got it in. But and it, but it, for it to become effective, and so it doesn't slip out of your mind, you've actually sort of got to think about it. Oh, you know, you sort of got to take the stuff and then like maybe sit down later on, or while you're here, sort of thinking, gee, what would be an experience that would be like if someone's angry? What would that be like? Uh, Barbara, you've got your hand in the list here too. Barbara, you go first. I yep. guess what my what comes to my mind in experience similar to the cause is then it will come back to me as people being angry with me. Okay, experience is similar to the cause. Y- yeah, that's okay. And then what would happen to you? What would your experience be when others are angry at you? Um, it, it doesn't feel good when people are angry at you. It depends on the degree of anger, I would think. Yeah. Okay. So suppose somebody is very angry at you. <clears throat> How would you feel? What, 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 what's the normal reaction? I, I would think it, it could be fearful. I could be, I right. could be afraid. Fearful is a good word. And so fearful is an experience similar to the cause, so we have a great deal of fear within the mind. Yeah. Any anyone else? Uh, Alicia, you had to, you had some ideas. Yeah, I was going to say a similar thing of people being angry back at you. Yeah. yeah so yeah. so they can do that, but this thing was what, what's happening back here. It's your experience, uh, not not out there. Oh uh, yeah. So um, yeah, I agree. You'd feel fearful and 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 sort of maybe no degree of self confidence. Like it would really undermine any kind of confidence do you have in your own kind of knowledge or actions yeah. and so on. Yep, yeah, that's right. Um, Michael, what about loneliness or isolation? Because e- e- either either because I'm angry that leads me to a pe- place of loneliness and isolation, or maybe I'm lonely and isolated, and that's what makes me angry. Yeah, so if you um, if you take this idea of being lo- uh, isolated, it's arising from a sense of suspicion and paranoia. If it was suspicion and paranoia that you withdrew, this would be the experiential effect of being angry. Yeah? So you have. Uh, paranoia, uh, suspicion, fear, and you can also be like frightened for some reason you can't work out. Right? You're just sort of um, scared. Although nothing is actually working, making you afraid, you're actually afraid. You feel scared often, uncertain, unsure. Um, Latifa, yep, your um, your microphone, sweetie, change your microphone. 
Yeah. So I'm still, there's some kind of gap that I'm not quite understanding your question, but I get like the original question, but I get angry and I gave one of my, my parts, you know, a couple of weeks ago to you, I wrote it in. I get angry when there's a lot of sound, like unpleasant sound, one of those lists, you know, you lot, you try to get pleasant sounds and then I'm in unpleasant sounds. And when that happens, I get irritated and exhausted. Okay. So these are some of the ones I've written down from the texts. Uh, it says, um, fear, the mind is often tormented. Uh, suspicion, paranoia, a sense of um, that you you find it you you are uh, okay, so you aren't able to be harmonious in the company of others, uh, and being frightened for no particular reason, no obvious reason. So these are the experiential results of being angry. So the remorse, having remorse for being angry, stops that. Right. Now, of course, we also know that there are uh, other, like, like, effects of anger. So um, we're going to look at some of them now, and I think you would know some of these. Now, like I said, this is what remorse specifically stops, being fearful in, the, in, in this life. You know, so if you are very fearful, if you are quite paranoid, and I'm, I'm just thinking here, to me it made quite a lot of sense because when I was growing up, my father was a very, um, very angry person. So whenever, I, whenever we were home, we were always afraid. We were afraid of him. We were scared. So there we have somebody like the outer person being angry, but the effect on us is like this fear type thing. It's just like, it's like say, okay, now Eddie, now when you grow up and, and you get angry, right, What's what's driving what's driving that? What's this experiential thing? Well, it's this fear, paranoia, this disharmony. Can't have harmony with your children, or with others. So, Eddie, this this um, I'm finding quite surprising because it's not actually that intuitive to put it together like that. To actually no. have, it, it, it's quite deep, this, not obvious at all to me. <laughs> so, you know, like, even in, like, in the, today, is it, like, we're, we're going around, one of the things um, that can make you really angry is to be scared. Yeah, that's right. Like, when people get uh, intimidated, yeah, it's the anger that comes out, and it's really hard to see underneath it is fear, it's being fear. scared. Fear is driving it. Yeah, so this is what you find. You find in this life as a human being, we have a great deal of fear. Mm. Now, um, in terms of remorse opposing these angers, right, so we have the um, fruitional consequences of a lower realm rebirth. Right? So that, that, that's, that's a biggie. Right? But then you say, okay, so... But suppose I don't find myself in the lower realms, I actually find myself being a human being like we are right now. So he says, okay, there are consequences for that too. They're not the fruitional consequence, but there are others. So one is that you find that when you, the environment you find yourself in, there's a lot of dispute there. There could be epidemics, calamities take place, poor food, land is barren, there's dangerous animals. And we're going to find that you know, the, um, there's something we can do about that too. So when we actually put all the four powers together, it will purify that. 
And here the causally concordant result. So when, when uh, the behavioral result is just, we just, we're an angry person again. Uh, and of course, like we said, in terms of experience, it's these fear, torment, suspicion, guilt, disharmony, paranoia, and fright. So by engaging in these four opponent powers, we, we want to stop all these sort of things taking place. And, and the remorse is stopping the experience. So I'm sure none of us want to be living a life full of fear, tormented by our own thoughts. None of us want to live lives where we're suspicious of everything, feeling guilty. So this, um, when we have remorse for something, like I said last year, we've we actually know, we have, it only comes about authentic when we know the consequences. So these are the consequences, the experiential consequence of being angry. So I think none of us want to have these experiences. So this can really, not wanting that, that really makes, uh, remorse powerful. Okay. Um, well, a quote from Shantideva from the Bodhisattva's Way of Life. He says, look, there's no, no evil is this similar to anger. Uh, no austerity to, compare, to be compared with patience. Steep yourself, therefore, in patience in various ways, um, insistently. Now, um, I'm sure your parents would have done what my parents tried to do with me, and, and, and you will try and do with your children, or with anyone you care for. Right? If you can see, it's obvious to you, but maybe not to them, that there's going to be a big problem that's going to come if, if your children or your loved ones do something that is destructive, unskillful. Right? You try and warn them, don't you? You say, please, darling, don't do that because, <laughs> and then you tell them the consequences. Right? This is the same thing we have to do with ourselves. Right? We go, oh my gosh, what are the consequences of my own anger? And you find, oh my God, they're terrible. And this is this, so they get this natural thing to go, oh, I've, I've got a rain in my anger. Right? So I was talking to Miffy this morning about doing another course on this and thinking, but some of us think that actually it's quite beneficial, it's useful to be angry. Right? There's, there's some good payoff by being angry. And, and basically, there are but it's very short term. So I was saying to Miffy, I'd love to present a course where you could actually look at what are the short term benefits of anger and what are the long term problems? And you ask yourself, you know, okay, I can see a short term benefit for being angry. Is there a long term benefit for being angry? And then you'll find, no, there mm -hmm. aren't any. Okay. Just living as human beings, what anger does to the body is, is absolutely terrible. Uh, drive your blood pressure up, contribute to all sorts of illnesses. In terms of your mind, you can drive yourself insane. Uh, so long-term benefit, terrible. Short-term, the only one good thing it does is, is like sort of separates you very quickly from the object you're sort of angry, angry with. You're trying to push something away. Miffy. Yeah. Um... Just on the news last night, they had someone talking about the war in Ukraine and various other wars and just saying there's not one good thing about war. It's not worth it. They're a soldier. <laughs> and they're saying not one good thing, not short term, not long term. All it does is just harm everybody. Yeah. So even there where you think, you know, I'm protecting still, That's there's right. not one good thing about it. Um, so, what, what, what's very useful for us to do is to have a look at this and go, so, okay, you know, what, are the, what, what are the problems then with being angry? What happens to me? What would happen to me? So, there's a lot of problems, like, 
you'll find it take place in this life, but then you can also see the problems that follow on from this life. You know, there's the fruitional result, there's an environmental result, there's a behavioral result, and there's experiential results, and none of them are good. So we have to find ways to, um, first of all, like stop the result of our angry mind coming out of our body or our mouth. Right? So we don't actually harm someone else. So we're already harming ourselves by getting angry. That's that's given already. Right? But we haven't yet used the body or the speech. And one of the major ways that you can do that is to quickly remind yourself of the consequences of being angry. So um, if you go to the text, you know, there are pages of the consequences of anger, and, and they're all saying these are the bad outcomes. So, um, so one of them is this, there isn't any good that comes from anger due to it by good qualities and reputation decline. And they do, don't they? I mean, if you've ever had somebody being angry in your face, I mean, you don't keep thinking, wow, I really like you. Uh, you know, um, you're such good company. <laughs> right? Straight away, their reputation in your mind declines. Right? And actually, in fact, you think being around them is really difficult. Like, I don't know what they're going to do. Every time they get angry, it's like it's really uncomfortable for me. Right? And, you, and you start thinking, oh, that angry person. You don't even see them as a whole person anymore. No. You just think the angry person. That's right. And so one of the things with my dad was his face would get so red. You know, and if you've been in front of people whose faces goes red, some of the spit comes out of their mouth too. And what you do is you get really scared of them. Well, I do. I, I go on high alert. It's like it's dangerous being with this person. And that's how others feel when we're angry. So you, you take on a sort of ugly look. Not only that, but then you find that it's, have you ever been angry and then tried to eat something? And notice, like, can you taste that food? Does it taste like it normally does? It doesn't. It's often tasteless. Not only that, but then you can't sleep. It's really hard to sleep when you're angry. Yeah, and so this is just in this life, but the, you know, the Buddha says it also destroy your virtue, it destroys your merit. Um, the other thing is you make a lot of enemies. And, and so, Eddie, you, you also, you can't, um, you, you can't enjoy anything, like you can't uh, access any happy feelings anymore. Uh, when no, well, That's right, while you're angry, happiness has moved out. Uh, so, Kate, yes, many times, yes, angry people are already frightened themselves. They feel intimidated in some way. They're meeting something that they don't want to meet and they want to, to um, be free of it. They, they really don't have any other skill to rely upon other than anger. And that's the same with animals too. I mean, you know, if, if you have a snarling dog, that's that's underneath that is fear. Yeah. So, Alicia, you have your hand raised. You'd like to ask something? Yeah, um, you might be getting to this, um, but I was curious to know, um, while we're still um, working, like before we're able to get rid of our anger or um, our attachment or ignorance that creates the anger in our minds, like um, yeah. whilst that's what we aspire to, um, like you were saying before, you know, quite often we'll be going about our lives and something will happen and, and the anger arises. Sure. So I, so I guess that's when, um, that's when it's almost like you can't help it. Like that quote you said about, it's almost like, um, instinctive kind of reaction, um, yeah. for that anger to come up. And so that's when we use the four opponent powers to, to purify that anger and kind of keep aspiring to the to, to we get to the point where the anger just won't be our natural response is that I guess what I'm asking is like we're a work in progress yeah we <laughs> and are what do we do while we're still kind of feeling angry because <laughs> yep, I because right. I've got to be 
careful yeah. not to sometimes um like i think suppressing the anger then because like you feel like oh no being angry has all these terrible consequences so i can't yeah. be angry so then you kind of just you still feel angry but you try and deny it or you push it down and i and like that's no, really no, not that's, helpful no, that's not going to help you have to go well so like i said before if you feel angry right, yeah the first person being harmed is you yeah there's no one else being harmed but you Right? Yeah. You open your mouth or you do something with your body, then you probably hurt somebody else too. So now you've got two yeah. suffering people. Yeah? Yeah. So you have to know that, okay, whenever if I get angry, this is what's going to happen. Yeah. Right? So then you might be asked, the thing to ask is, could there be some other response I could make? Okay. Right? So, of course, there are. There's heaps of them. But the thing is, it's tricky, isn't it? It's like, so what you might get, like I said, if you find yourself already angry, yeah. Right? It's hard to reason then. You, you, it's very difficult to go, oh, hang on, the faults of anger are this. Like, this. Act, I'm doing all these things. Mm. Right? But but there is a way I'm going to show you what you can do, which sort of cuts okay. it really quickly. Uh, Miffy. Yeah. Just adding to what Alicia said, it strikes me in a way that um, actually if we do suppress our anger so that we don't say, we don't retaliate with our speech or physically, that's a really good thing because at least we don't make the situation worse. But I think what happens, Alicia, is that because we think our anger is to do with the person out there, once we've suppressed our speech and our physical reactions, then we think it's over. But actually the anger is to do with us. And so what we've got to do then is work on our mind, why we got angry. But because we're always focused out there, then we, we don't do that bit and then the suppression becomes dangerous. <clears throat> But on balance between hitting out and suppressing your anger, at least suppressing it, you're not making more negative karma. Yeah. And so there are different ways of suppression too. Some might be like you say, to sort of, you know, some people um, feel guilty about it, about being angry, right? So it's like, like just push it down. But there's other ways of suppressing anger too that are much more skillful. You know, so if you look at suppression, meaning it's not coming out through my hands or my mouth. Right? So it's been suppressed in that way, which is a good thing. But then it's like, well, how did I do that? The only thing left is your mind, isn't it? Your mind has to stop it. But not by just pushing it down and keeping it in there and having this resentment and guilt. That's that's no way to do it. I mean, if you don't have any methods, that's what the normal method is. You know, or you say, I don't care. I just won't care. So those methods aren't skillful. They won't help you. Uh, Barbara? I think when you suppress it, your anger in the moment by not saying something or, or doing something with your body, at least it buys you time it creates some space then where you can come up with, like Venerable Rubina always says, then argue with it. You know, if somebody says yeah. something that's hurt, hurtful or whatever, then just argue with, with it, argue with it. You know, don't suppress it, don't, yeah. don't not deal with it. But I think suppression buys you time so that then yeah. you can yeah. use other methods. Yeah. So I'm gonna show you a method where you can buy yourself a lot of time. Right? It's, it's a very, I, I find it very skillful and very useful, and I do it myself, and it buys you plenty of time. So let's, okay, so we have this, um, so the first power we've looked at, the opponent power here, is this remorse. And like I said, the remorse is based on your knowledge of what anger actually does to you, what its consequences are. So this is like a sense of kindness to yourself, a sense of self-care. What you'd also call like renunciation. Uh, you see, oh my God, it, this is what I'm doing to myself when I get angry. Oh my God, like, no, 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 no. I don't want. Um, I don't want that. I don't want to keep hurting myself. But this is what remorse is doing. It actually look goes. This is the consequence for you. Knowing that. Knowing that, you know, how it impacts 
our health as human beings, our physical health and our mental health. That just should, it's in, we don't need to push it down. We just go, oh my God, that's what I'm doing to myself. I don't need to push it down and keep it in here. That's, that's no good. That keeps the hurt all here. At least when I don't say anything or hold my body back, I don't push it out there as well. So what are we going to rely on so that we don't suppress it and we don't push it out there? That's our next, <laughs> that's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> what am I going to rely on? What do I need to do? Well, thank goodness we've got the answer. It's to rely upon the three jewels and the mind of enlightenment. That's what we need to rely upon. And this reliance stops the fruitional effect of being thrown into the lower realms and it also stops the environmental karma that we experience when we're in the human realm. So what does it mean to rely upon the three jewels of refuge on the mind of enlightenment? It means, first of all, to re-establish the right attitude. If we are Buddhists, we have taken refuge in the three jewels. This is our primary means to put an end to our own afflictive emotions and develop all of our good qualities. So we've got to come back home. Right? Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. In other words, focus our mind in the right direction, the safe direction. A uh, refuge in the Pali tradition is, is called like um, a house. A refuge is a house, a shelter or a protection. They're, they're, they're where they use a uh, saranam. It means like you come home, come back home. Shelter yourself, protect yourself. In um, Tibetan Buddhism, kavdro, kavdro is the word for refuge, and it means sort of seek protection or relief. So it's, we're going to protect ourselves from the outcomes of, of our anger. If our anger is expressed verbally or physically. We want to protect ourselves from the outcomes, but we also, like the anger being mental, it's, it's going to harm us. So we've got to st stop that harm as quickly as we possibly can. And the way to do that is relying upon inner and outer Buddha, inner Dharma, inner Sangha. This is the refuge. This is if we have faith in the Buddha Dharma, and we're called Buddhists once we've taken refuge in it. However, that's faith-based, the other is reason-based, and that's on the four seals. So if we are familiar with what the four seals are, we can protect ourselves. If we're not, then we better know what Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is, and particularly what they mean, uh, inner Buddha, inner Dharma, inner Sangha. So as you know, uh, outer Buddha, refuge is often seen as a historical Buddha, or what they call the four bodies of a Buddha. But if you think about that, you're gonna, that's gonna be very difficult we need a great deal of knowledge about that. And the historical Buddha passed away many years ago, so he's not going to be able, you're not going to have access to him to say, Eddie, you're going to be all right. <laughs> I'll help you here, mate. The outer Dharma, what is that? Anybody? Does anybody remember what the outer Dharma is? It's the well, books Latifa. and the texts, isn't it? It's the books and the texts that we rely upon. Outer Dharma, right? So having that is not going to help you a great deal. If you're holding that there, you can still be angry, can't you? You can hold a Dharma book in your hand and be really upset, right? So that's not the refuge. You, you might end up whacking someone over the head with your Dharma book. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> sometimes when Miffy gets upset with me, she takes my Dharma books away. <laughs> she knows that will have the, a big effect on me. <laughs> it's the only way to get Eddie's undivided attention. 
<laughs> and we also know that you know sometimes even having an outer sangha member like you know like you can still be raging inside you, you might have enough discipline to not say anything or behave badly or crazily but inside you could be raging so i want to ask you so what do we think what is uh the um inner inner buddha So here we have to remember that the potential we have to awaken, the potential of the, that the mind has, that no um, disturbing emotion is innate to the mind. The mind's actually clear light. Right? Inner dharma is the collection of your um, inner wealth, your inner good qualities. What's the terms? So these are the good qualities we have. We already have the ability to concentrate. So in other words, you know, you can take some of this away and hold it in your mind. So concentration and mindfulness. They're two very good inner qualities that we all have at present. We also have the ability <coughs> to investigate our own mind and investigate the situation. There are times of tranquility that we can develop. We're often happy. We have a sense of, we can energize ourselves and we can also have a sense of equanimity about things. So I often call these the seven factors of enlightenment. They're present within us already. Right, so that's our inner dharma. Inner sangha is just like the, the um, what do you call it? The the collection of all the good qualities. Well, all the positive mind states. All the and... positive mind states. So this inner dharma, if you look at it, we might not, you know, we have true true paths and true cessations if you want to sum all the inner dharma up in terms of realisation. So inner paths just means we have methods that can work. All we have to do is rely upon them and, we can, and then the anger can't arise, right? So that's a sort of a temporary cessation. If you want to put an end to anger altogether, of course, we need, we have, we need to have the real, realization of emptiness um, perceptually, directly. So if you ask yourself, do I actually have the wisdom realized in emptiness right now? If your answer is no, then you use the methods because they can interrupt your anger and produce a cessation. It'll be temporary, but it's good. We need those temporary cessations. And like I said, the inner sangha, all the good qualities you presently have at the moment, you can rely upon them. Inner Buddha is this, this nature to flourish, this nature to actually become a better person, to awaken fully. That's already there. We, we need to rely on this, on these qualities we have. In terms of the four seals, we need to remember that whatever is produced depends upon causes and conditions. And then that produced phenomena is subject to change. So you can know, okay, as you know, if I ask you, are you angry right now? You'd probably say, no, Eddie, I'm not. Right? But if something bad happened to you, you could change, couldn't you? And you could, be, you could become angry. And then after a little while, you won't be angry again. So this is impermanence at play. So we see people change, we are people. Our mind, it changes. So things will change. But we need to remember that, that anger is a dependent arising, depend upon causes and conditions. They're all subject uh, to change. Uh, any um, phenomena that is produced through karma and delusion will produce suffering. This is the, the second seal. And lastly, all phenomena are empty and selfless. This is just their nature. Uh, so in other words, if you really look for what we call anger, we call ourselves anger. If you look, if you decide, like, I'm going to analyze my mind to find the anger, and I'm going to throw it out, 
you won't find any there. Anger doesn't exist like that. It's empty of that type of, of objective existence. But if we look for ourselves within our body continuum, body mind continuum, for, for us, who is the angry person, no such person will be found. We don't exist in that objective way either. So all phenomena are empty and selfless. Uh, polluted phenomena, of course, they produce suffering, they depend upon karma and delusion, and all of it's impermanent. So, you know, sometimes you might find that you, you get angry, but the event's already over. But, but you're still angry. <laughs> it's like, like you're holding on to something, like it's still going on. It's not. <laughs> it's over. But this, this gravity, we, we make it permanent, stable, and then we get the effects of it. Even though it's not true, we get the effects. Miffy. So, so, Eddie, when you're talking about this, the four seals, as a, as a refuge, this is um, dependent on us being able to really use our reasoning, which is... Yeah the last thing that happens when we're angry. Well, so this is where you have, so there you can say, okay, so now I'm angry. Uh, but if like I'm saying, I'm going to introduce you to a method here where you can, you can cut yeah. this pretty much pretty quickly. But you have to remember it. <laughs> you must remember it. That's the only way you can apply it. If you, if you don't, and like I said, like, yeah, a little while ago, I think I told you guys, a little while ago, um, Miffy did something. Stop the screen here, Han. So a little while ago, Miffy did something that made me so cranky. I got angry. And so, of course, I was up out of this chair. I was in there, blah, 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 blah. And while I'm saying it, it was like, I want to say, that's a bit extreme, Eddie. <laughs> so even though my mouth was doing this, my mind was recognizing, gee, what's coming out of the mouth is a little bit extreme. <laughs> I went, oh, well, stop. Yeah. It's not like you lose your, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a part, in a way, you're always sort of free in a way, but you've got to sort of see it. Like, it's so you know, funny. You're saying these things, it's like, yeah, there's a me here, but I'm aware of it. I'm aware of this. Oh, well, I was thinking the same thing as you. That, that's a bit extreme, Eddie. <laughs> You know, so as soon as I said, it's like, oh, well, stop. It's just not what I'm saying is actually, you know, a little <laughs> over the top. Um, calm down. Right? And then very quickly, I could say to him, I'm sorry. You know, just finish it. So, it's, yeah, it's the same here in this year. You know, sometimes you are going to get angry. But it's like, okay, that's true. Um, man, try and make the moments of it shorter and shorter and shorter. Don't keep holding on and be resentful and keep it going. Don't keep thinking over your reasons to be angry because you'll keep so stirring Eddie, it up. Would one of those things be like, you know, when we notice ourselves being so highly dramatic like that to just say, oh, that's a bit extreme, Mithy, in the, in the sentence as, you, as you're, as you know, saying the things. But they make you cry it out. And, and Eddie, is that where I would think discipline comes in? Yeah. Because you can have the thought that I'm being extreme, but as the words are coming out, it takes the it takes discipline then to to stop the words and let that thought become in the forefront. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, thank you, Michael, for putting up these four um, seals like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's a little thing, something to think about, right? So when you, uh, Alicia was going to ask something here. You got your hand raised, Alicia? Yeah, yeah. sorry, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, so if you find yourself um, um, experiencing anger, perhaps that you didn't even realise that you had um, yeah. in your mind um, from things that have happened a long time ago, like even back yeah. in childhood and so yeah. on, um, things that happened or didn't happen and so on, um, perhaps rather than focusing on Maybe, maybe um, a good would a good approach maybe be to think about like what are the thoughts in my mind, like uh, that are making that are creating that anger. Like instead of instead of focusing on the external circumstances that 
perhaps make you then feel anger. It might be like, what are the beliefs that I had or what are the kind of conceptions that I have in my mind that are that are creating aversion to what to what to place or I'm going to give you this um antidote. Okay. Hang on, right? and okay. It's, um, you, you, you can do all that, but I found this one, it just cuts it straight off and then you can do something positive pretty much immediately. Okay, thanks. You get the space, the anger disappears and you get the space and now you can yep. behave differently. And when your behavior is different, it'll, it'll come up to your mouth and your hands. Right? Yep. Your mind will have changed. Yeah. So the anger won't be hindering you. Um, a, a quick, I better get a move on, haven't I? Uh, this class finishes when? Half 12? Yeah. And of course, the other um, thing to recollect is, you know, what is, like I said, when we start off each day, what's, what's your purpose for living? You know, if your purpose is, well, my purpose is to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So you know, you go out there, anger comes out, that's not going to help sentient beings. That's going to hurt them. It actually goes contrary to your purpose in life. So if you've if you actually looked at this and go, the best thing I can do for myself is to rid myself of all the disturbing emotions, develop all the positive qualities to help others and myself. That's my purpose. You'll know anger doesn't do that. Anger hurts you and hurts others. So it's not the type of mind to bring into your purpose. So it's, it's good to have that front and center into the way you live your life. Nevertheless, we can still get angry. <laughs> There's things, things that come out of left field and suddenly this is just drops right out of your mind. You don't like what you're facing and you're angry. But that can happen. But this idea of each morning walking out the door, you know, you know, I walk out that door, I'm going to meet a whole lot of things that are not in my control people in particular. Uh, when I do, what do I have control over? Yeah, me, my mind. I've got to use it. So developing this wish, keep it front and centre. you got 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, please. So, like I see, so Shanti Davis says, the state of Buddhahood depends on beings and on Buddhas Equally, what kind of practice is it then that honors only Buddhas but not beings? So I love this because it just shows myself the hypocrisy. Uh, and I think I don't want to be a hypocrite. It's like, you know, laughing at everybody else making mistakes, go, but guess what? I'm doing the same thing. It's like, well, that's not so good, is it? <laughs> uh, Okay, let's move on. So these are the actions that are coming up, right? So remedial actions opposed to throwing karma. So any virtuous act done for purification can be seen as an opponent force. As long as, like we said, like, like, like we've got to decide, I want to overcome anger, so these, this is what I'm going to do. But these are the opponent forces I'm going to use. And we're walking down to those opponent forces we can use in the small scope, middle scope, and great scope. Because we... I'm running out of time. So, first is appreciate your potential. So, this um, many years ago, I, I attended a teaching for my um, my lama, uh, Kinsu Rinpoche, Gishitashi Seri. He taught on a text called Letter to a Friend. Some of you might be familiar with it. So, in ver verse 60, Nagarjuna says, more stupid yet than one who throws some slops into a golden vessel all bejeweled is he who has gained a precious human birth and wasted in an evil, sinful life. So that, I heard that that was so shocking and so true for me. Oh, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing right now. So in, in my mind, I've got this like this image, you know, like like they've got this beautiful jeweled vessel. So the the, the vessel is this life you have. Right? 
The jewels are your senses. So your senses make contact with objects and, and it fills the vessel. So I think in that case, so that's right. So what am I filling the vessel with? And this simple answer I gave to myself was caca, crap. Right? That's what you're doing. You're putting it in here and you're stinking up your world. And every person you come in contact with and push out this anger, this caca, right? it's stinky. No one wants to be near you. Nobody wants to be close to you. Everybody runs. So you end up like alone, like, like Michael was saying, by yourself. Fearful. That's what anger does. It, it rots you from the inside. And for everything outside, hey man, they're, they're gone. So as you know, people's marriages break down through anger. Friendships break down through anger. Father, families fall apart through anger. So, but you know, so we have this great potential to become fully awakened beings because we're human with a human mind. It's fantastic. Like I said, you know. Like, <laughs> Don't fill your life up with crap. <laughs> right? That's what anger does. Second thing is remember impermanence. Everything is subject to change. So that the people are angry, you could change. You can change. Your anger that you have in your mind will change. But please, like this urgency, the sense that, you know, some people, when they get angry, they die. Anger contributes to heart attacks. You could die by being angry. And there's no way any of us can say, well, not me. <laughs> I won't die when I'm angry. Shit, you don't want to die when you're angry. The fruition result is as absolutely horrifying. So you know, you, you bring these sort of you, you know, like you're listening to me, you read some stuff, and you try and integrate it all so that it suddenly becomes very clear to you, Jesus, I like anger. No, I've, I've got to do my best, do my best. And we take refuge in ourselves in these teachings. You know, one of the first teachings of the Buddha is restrain yourself from harm. Restrain harming. It's not just others, it's ourselves. Anger harms us, it harms others. Uh, if you see the terrible outcomes of it, you know, it's not like it doesn't have to be like a forceful thing, or like you're saying this, you're like pushing it down. What's going to happen is going to be like natural. You just naturally know, God, you know, when the, when the ring on the stove is on and I put my hand on it, it burns me. Jeez, it hurts. Like, you know, right? So you go, I'm going to put my, you know, like, hey, I don't even have to think about it, right? I'm not putting my hand on the stove while the ring's on. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's, renunciation should be like it. It's like a natural outcome. It doesn't have, it shouldn't be forced. It doesn't have to be forced. It's just, we know outcomes. We don't want them. You know, okay, what are the causes? Oh, these are them. Okay, one of them is anger. Okay, try to be angry. Another little quote, so the wise and mindful person knows them and sees that they are subject to change. So like I said, when we look at people who are uh, exhibiting uh, anger, we know that the anger can change, the person can change, we can change. So when we meet up with these undesirable conditions of having somebody in front of us who is angry, or we find that conditions are supporting us to become angry, we don't buy into it. Let's go on to the next slide. So, oh my God, I've got to move, don't I? And I've got to give you the, the antidote, which is a really good one. So you can't leave agency. us hanging. <laughs> agency just means agency is referring to karma cause and effect, which means we are responsible. We are the creators of our unhappiness. If we want to create unhappiness, just get angry. You'll, you'll be unhappy. You win. <laughs> if you want to be happy, you've got to create the causes for it. No one else can do it. We have to. And we remember the, you know, the first class or the second class about um, how karma can expand. Right? If you do this, un you do a destructive act, the result is destructive and it can increase. 
So there we've got to have it like the next thing is like have a, a distaste. So often in the, the lamb room it's called um, looking at the faults of cyclic existence. So cyclic existence is just our own consciousness in this really uncontrolled fact way of moving up and down, round and round, never satisfied. Uh, and in response to some of dissatisfactions, anger comes out. As Rabina said, anger is, sorry, um, anger is attachment not getting what it wants. Yeah. And attachment keeps us in cyclic existence. So now I'll better give you the antidote before we go to the next one. The four words. So when you find, if you find yourself angry, you're like you're really angry, or you can notice it coming. You're, you've thought something, but you're not really angry yet. But you're on the way. You know, you know. If I just, I just got to keep thinking like this, and I'm going to get angry. I'm going to get upset. So right there, just ask yourself: Is this thought useful? So please write it down, don't forget it, and say it and see what happens. Okay. Now, with the background of anger that we've already talked about, if you ask that question, what happens is immediately a space opens up in the mind. You have leverage, you have room to move now. You can try this out. You, you will find there's a space there now. You are not angry now. One of the major reasons for that is because your mind is not focused on the object that made you angry. It has another focus. It's this question. Eddie, is can this you stop this? Useful? Can you stop the screen share and just say the, the four words again for us? <laughs> okay. Is this thought useful? There'll be a thing inside you that. You don't even have to say anything. It'll just be no. But there's no word coming. You just get this big space. It'll be no, it's not. There's no use for this. But it's just that the truth is right there. And you just rest in it. Just rest in it. And you can come out of that and do a lot of skillful things after that. You're out of the grips of anger. Believe me, this works. All you have to do is remember is this thought useful? That's right. Yep. I T T U. <laughs> is this thought useful? It's not a lot to remember, but this is like the mindfulness, right? And yes, Kate, it does. It works for so many different things. I was doing it last night. You know, it wasn't anger, just crazy thinking. You know, just my mind just takes off as you do. You know, you're lying there and there's stuff crap running around in my brain. And I just go, is this useful? Is this thought useful? Big gap straight away. And then you just relax and you know, find something you find yourself asleep. But you could move from that open spaciousness and start engaging in the practices of the great scope, which I will put up now. Eddie, I, I feel like um, then that course that you were talking about that looks at the short term sort of yep. not benefits, but the short term, like we think that anger is useful, but it's not. Obviously, um, I think that's really helpful then to recognize like we might feel like anger is useful and, and energizing, but we know that the harmfulness of it far outweighs any yeah, short term kind of benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So one of the things that people will say about if you say, so what's, what's great about anger? So sometimes people will say, well, the energy gives a great deal of energy to, to go against something that's, you know, like injustice, for instance, you know, to yeah, right so wrongs. Right. It gives this great mm. energy. Right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does. Right? That's short term. Right? You want to make a change. Right? The anger mm. usually goes against, there's something, what we think, there's something obstructing my happiness. There's something obstructing the way I think things should be. Mm. It should be like this, but this is what I'm getting. Anger comes up. Right? So it gives you energy to work against that thing. Mm. But you go, okay, yep, that's that's the short-term benefit. Right? Mm. Are there any others? 
And you felt very quickly, uh, no. <laughs> you know? So, and then how about, okay, there's no long term benefits. Are there long term harms? Mm. You have to go, well, yeah, especially to me, my body, my mind, what that does, that's for sure. Uh, so I remember one, one time that people were talking about um, John Lennon, you know, he, was, he did that peace campaign right back in the 60s, I think. Uh, give peace a chance, they did the bedding. This guy interviewed me, he says, for a guy who's propounding peace, he's the most angriest guy I've ever met. Uh, so like that, you know, so I've got the energy to make change, but boy, what it, what it can do to you inside and how it can affect other people, that's, that's not so good. And you can ask, well, I want to make these changes. Is there some other sort of way I could think about it? And you go, yeah, there are. Like compassion, love and kindness. These are also give you great strengths to make changes. So the anger's not needed there. Okay. So, like I said, will you do this? <laughs> Is this thought helpful? <laughs> There's nothing whatsoever that is not made easier through habit and acquaintance. Putting up with the little cares, I'll train myself to bear with greater adversities. So if you find just, just even little things, just try this technique out. Is this thought helpful? And then build it up to the bigger ones. And you know, it just works every time, every time. So leading us to the great scope remedial action. So, so of course, we can think that the people who are behaving badly to us, who are angry at us, right? and then in response to them becoming angry at us, then we could become angry at them. Right? So ways of thinking about this, we think of them as being our children. So, you know, so this means you've got to, you've got to look at, um, in the Pali tradition, this is one of their major ways. In the Mahayana tradition, we look at them as being our, our teachers and parents. But again, the idea is, is we get that space after we've asked ourselves, is this thought helpful? We get the gap. Now we can look at them and go, this person's been my mother, my child, my father, all sorts of different things. And they are, as we can see, having a big problem. They're suffering. How can I help them? The other one is to, like we said, you know, to develop the sort of patience we need somebody to actually get up in our face and be crazy and angry with us. So that the angry person can look at them and say, oh, this person's teaching me how to respond with patience, kindness, clarity, compassion. I'm going to. I can. You know, because that, by asking that question, we've actually got a break between our anger and this new response. If you really listen to this idea of the Tong Lin, so I found that in lived situations, um, they happen so quickly, I can't sort of go, oh, yeah, I'm going to breathe in all their sufferings off them in black smoke and I want to give them all these things. You, you just do it mentally. In other words, you, you take their suffering off them by accepting their suffering state. Right? You accept this is the person in front of me who's suffering. Right? It's not all that comfortable to feel that and to be there. Right? So, okay, so let their suffering be placed on my indifference. Let, this, let their suffering destroy the indifference that I've often extended towards others. And in response, Eddie, how can I help? Eddie, what this is amazing with, with the Tong Len because it's not even about the indifference. It just, it's the exact other direction with anger is just like aversion, wanting to get rid of the person. And That's then right. Tong Len, just by accepting their unhappy state, That's right. thinking... Yep. Yeah, it's, it's like doing a complete U-turn in your head. Yeah, so this is one of the most effective methods you can use. So we use this to develop love and compassion, really positive mental states. The other stuff in the lower sections that I showed you, this is just how things are. 
Right? It's just, you know, things are impermanent. You know, karma does work like this and so forth. Uh, it's just, you know, and so we're not going to buy in, we're not going to create any more suffering. That's true. But here we're saying, not only am I not going to create more suffering, I'm going to create these great positive mental states. So we really empower ourselves, no? And this, of course, taken from the uh, Guru Yoga, Lama Chepa. So he says, and thus perfect, pure, compassionate gurus are seek your blessings, that all karmic debts, obstacles and sufferings of mother beings may with exception ripen on me right now, and that I may give my happiness and virtue to others and thereby invest all beings in bliss. So when we say ripen on me right now, it's, it's not, you know, we're not putting it on the conventionally existent me. The I that exists in mere name. We're not, that's not the go. We're putting it on something, the thing that caused all these problems in the first place. Yeah? Our selfishness, our indifference. So I don't want to be like that anymore. I want to respond more with care. And, and, and so we do. Now, look, there's another um, antidote here. So there's two here, but I'll just bring you to the first one. Right? The syllable A. Uh, so this is the syllable ah. And the other we can use is like illusions. When you're out in the world, we use our understanding of emptiness and dependent origination to see that what's actually going on is not existing in the way it appears to us, like an illusion. The syllable ah is, is great, right? Why? Because ah is a negation. In fact, they say, you know, if you want to um, symbolize the beginningless and endless empty subtle mind it's a it's a symbol ah what it's to neg what it negates ah is a negation ah negates inherent existence now what's what you can do though so this is uh, what you can do is take this and you can go Something happens, you're about to respond. If you don't go, use that, that method that I gave you. Is this thought helpful? Is this thought useful? If you don't do that, go, uh uh. Or instead, of, or you could go, uh uh. <laughs> yeah, again, it's uh -uh. like, uh uh, right? Don't grasp it, this appearance to be truly existent. Because if you do, you're angry, you're away. So this is this. Nice way of quickly reminding yourself, you know, if you become familiar with emptiness and you like the idea of, wow, well, that's really great, ah, negates everything. And it's, it's like it incorporates all the Buddhist teachings on ultimate reality, all heart sutra, the heart sutras in this. So if we say, ah, uh, ah, uh, that, that not only halts our retaliation, but it halts our grasping at this is a bad situation and it's your fault. Yep. It halts all of that too. And so you go, uh uh, hold on. It gives you the time to go, oh, that person's act, that angry person's actually suffered a great deal. Now, again, you could go, oh, what can I do? How can I help? It gives you breathing space again. So, like, um, so we, we got this teaching on the symbol uh, last Sunday from, from Geshe Zopa. And as he said, I thought, oh my God, this is a great way to use it. You know, just, by saying it, ah, right? so you got like, like say it to break the connection between yourself and this angry thought about the things happening. Break it, and you go, oh, whatever's going on here is a dependent arising. But it's not this 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 bloke's behaviour and him; they're not the same things. There's a person who's suffering. And the response to their own suffering is anger and rage. So, you know, for those of you who've had children, you will know your children get pretty cranky at some different stages, isn't it? You know, and, and you can't just respond by yelling back at them or hitting them. <laughs> that doesn't work. Huh? So we have, we have to like put a pause in there, and the pause is, oh, my poor baby's suffering. My well, poor baby needs the nappy's changed. And we go and do it. 
It's the same here. It's just now kids are growing up. <laughs> just big kids. And they're still out of control. And, and we're still their parents. Or at least we can behave to them as parents, right? And go, ah, okay. I'll help. We'll leave the, we'll leave the illusions one for, for more next week. When we talk about um, the greed and so forth. This was about, this is a, a quote about dependent horizon, a very interesting way of looking at things. So he says, furthermore, appearances clear away the exterior of existence and emptiness clears away the exterior of non-existence. All the other schools have the opposite view. When you understand how emptiness shows itself as cause and result, that's why I really wanted to put this quote up here. There's harmony between cause and result and emptiness. That being the case, you'll never be enthralled by extreme views. And it has this funny, this, this resolve, right? So knowing all this, this, that we have methods, we know the outcomes of, of anger when we engage in it, we have to say no to it. Or, uh-uh, or, <laughs> Is this thought helpful? <laughs> Is this thought useful? It's about, yeah, it's. Yeah. So resolve basically means you have this attitude. You know, you, you've heard enough, you've thought about it. So please think about it, think about it. That'll hold, you, you get the thought, you get the thinking in there and you can't refute it through reasoning. Yeah, it's true. This is the way it is. So you can naturally adopt it then. It'll, it'll just become the way you are in the world. Right? You'll be a person with less anger. But it does require you <laughs> to remember what to do. <laughs> so we need mindfulness. We need to remember either uh-uh or all the faults of anger or is this thought helpful? Can you read the quote out, Eddie? So those who wish to guard their practice should very attentively guard their minds. For those who do not guard their minds will be unable to guard their practice. So once you become familiar with the antidotes, then you've got to sort of, um, you know, so Alyssa, you know, so we all have reasons to be angry at others, right? The thing is, are those reasons correct? So we, we need to challenge them. Like Rabina would say, no, I need against them, talk about them. Uh, the time to do that is when you're not angry. <laughs> Find your reasons and go, okay, this is what I think. Is it true? And you, over time, you, you will refute your own reasoning and go, oh my God, my reasons are based on emotions, just on feelings. I just, I just don't like the way it makes me feel. So what's our takeaway for today? You do know there are four opponent powers <laughs> and you know how these four opponent powers, you can apply them on the spot when you're angry. And, and what you'll find of course, is you, it's not like I'll go one, two and three and four. You'll, it's, you know, it's pretty much happens real quick, eh? You know? When you take refuge, you're taking refuge in your own inner resources. You know? And what is that, the Dharma? What's my Dharma? Is this thought helpful? Uh-uh. There's your method, done. Okay, well, I did notice my mind went up, got up. I didn't say anything with my mouth. I didn't do anything with my hands. Okay, great. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna get angry. I'm not gonna get angry. I don't need to get angry. And we'll just move on. Something else will happen. We'll just do the same thing again. So now we better finish our class really quickly so yep. <laughs> we don't blow it. <laughs> so next week we're going to use this against um, these four opponent powers against uh, greed and desirous attachment. And we'll see how we go. <laughs> so I think we've created some merit. I've really enjoyed talking to you about this and I hope it's 
impacted on you in some positive way. So due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the Supreme Jewel, Bodhicitta, not yet born, arise and grow. And may that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And as long as space endures and as long as sentient beings abide, may I too remain to dispel the sorrows of the world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I've gone over time. I just Stop enjoy the, the topic so much and your companies. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Stop the share. <laughs> and... <laughs> Is that thought helpful? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, everyone. And um, enjoy yourselves. Apply the antidote if you meet up with difficult circumstances. See how you go. I'm, I'm very excited now to apply it next time to go, uh-uh. <laughs>